Hello, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome you all to Historians on the Battleground of Social Media, Lessons from Eight Years of Ask Historians. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge on behalf of the panel that this year we meet on the territory of the Lenape peoples. We honor the Lenape people along with the Unkachag, Senecoc, Mantecoc, Mantequet, and Selecoc nations, whose historical and contemporary homes stand along the waters of both the north and south shores of Long Island. I am Peyton Hunter-Jones, a member of the Ask Historians moderation team. I've been involved since 2013 under the nom de guerre Georgie K. Zukov. Ask Historians was founded eight years ago with the intention of providing a platform where historians could engage directly with the public. I host it as a forum or subreddit on reddit.com. Ask Historians is connected to one of the largest sites on the internet. Since its founding, it has grown to become a community with hundreds of historian contributors, known in the parlance of the site as flared users or simply flares, whose expertise expands the breadth of human history. Averaging nearly two million unique visitors per month, making it the world's largest public history community, Ask Historians is a major portal for public engagement with academic-minded history. Because of its prominence, every day, as moderators of the site, we find ourselves on the battleground of the control of public discourse. We've worked over the years to build up a reputation for the site as one which stands against trolls, bigots, and those who seek to weaponize and distort history. We know how necessary it is to actively fight back as they attempt to disrupt conversations, if not attempt to control them to create their own false narratives. The panelists today, all members of the Ask Historians moderation team, as well as flared contributors in their own right, bring their expertise and experience in running the site to discuss the place of social media in the historical profession. They will be looking at both its unprecedented ability for public outreach, as well as how to combat the more unsavory elements that inevitably attempt to poison the experience for all. Our first speaker is Cassidy Prococo. Cassidy is the collections manager at the Fenimore Art Museum and Farming Museum. He joins the mod team in 2016 under the username Mimic of Modes. Her area of specialty is fashion and material culture. Today, she will be discussing the dynamics of Ask Historian subreddit in its Q&A format, looking at the user demographics and the trending of certain topics. Thank you. Thanks, and thank you to everybody for coming here today. Yep to listen to us discuss something that's so far from the typical academic experience. As moderators of Ask Historians, we have a unique power to influence the community by removing questions and attempts at answers. However, our power is limited by the fact that we're not the ones posting questions for the most part, and we can't make the question askers post what we want them to post. I'm here today to talk about the people who are asking the questions. Periodically, the Ask Historians mod team holds a survey of the user base, typically in response to a particular milestone of subscribers to the forum. Our fifth and most recent one was held after the subreddit reached a million subscribers this past year and included more specific demographic questions than we'd asked before as we have been working to improve the diversity of the subreddit. As in past years, the lopsided gender balance held firm with a full 81% identifying as male. But it transpired that among new users, the balance was improving, with only 72% identifying as male, 24% identified as female, and 3% as non-binary. A strong majority of the users were in their 20s, and a majority were American. 62% were from North America, nearly all from the United States or Canada. And 28% were from Europe, about a third of which were from the UK. 72% of our users were native English speakers, but there was again improvement, of our newer members, only 63% were. 45% of our users identified as a sexuality other than straight, and 4% identified as transgender. Given these demographics, one of the most common problems we face is that our question askers most readily identify with straight, white, cis men in history. For many, the attraction of history begins with the most basic question of, what would I have been doing if I had been born in the past? This perspective explores the past through the eyes of an everyman with these qualities. An infantry soldier at Dunkirk, a lone gunman in the Old West, or a peasant farmer in generic pre-modern Europe, and unfortunately, enslavers in the American South and non-Jewish Germans in World War II. Another avenue for the formulation of questions comes through media consumption, which, given that our user base is largely made up of white American men in their 20s, tends to reflect a narrow range of subjects. Game of Thrones was a typical topic, leading to questions like the following. Did people in the Middle Ages ever actually plan battles using miniatures on top of a big table map? What were brothels really like in the medieval period? And were people super mean in the Middle Ages? 
Game of Thrones has both reflected and enforced stereotypes about the Middle Ages, such as the idea of European countries being homogenous white spaces. So it's both frustrating to see it frequently asked about and rewarding to see experts point out the ways it's incorrect to a large audience. Another media property that informs our main demographic is the computer game Crusader Kings 2. The influence of this game's mechanics leads to uh, questions like, did medieval society consider social ranks to be part of a strict hierarchy, or was the chain of command more fluid? Or how common was excommunication in the High Middle Ages, and how were these people treated? In both cases, most of the people who were brought to wonder about the past due to these properties typically ended up asking about non-gendered or assumed male norms and the lives and customs of the powerful. Other games that sparked curiosity include The Witcher and Kingdom Come Deliverance. The latter inspired one of our most furious threads, which highlighted the problems of having an audience of young white men accustomed to being the audience for media aimed directly and solely at them. The question was, people are getting extremely upset because there are no black people in Kingdom Come Deliverance. How accurate is this for 16th century Bohemia? The response, by another mod not present here, linked to an older answer that described the existence of a number of non-white people in medieval Europe, and then focused more broadly on the way that game designers and players pick and choose which aspects of history are important for accuracy, and which are easily brushed away in favor of game mechanics. I'll quote from it. Thus, historical video games are never historically accurate. They can't be, for while the world of past people is approachable to us by a scholarship and description, it cannot be played for experiencing it is too far removed from any tangible mechanic that can be playified. Thus, what historical video games do is to shroud themselves in historical authenticity rather than accuracy. Authenticity is different from accuracy in that the former represents, in lockstep with cultural collective memory, what feels right about a specific past, rather than necessarily what really transpired in said past. In response, we had heated arguments that non-white characters would break immersion and a general failure to understand the distinction between accuracy and authenticity that was being made in the comment. I think most of us consider it a low point in terms of the white male identity politics of our main demographic overcoming their interest in history. This sort of thing is problematic from educational and social justice standpoints, but it adds an extra layer of problem for us as a website. The success of Ask Historians lies in its community of flared users. If we have flares in a certain subfield, we can generally assume that answers to questions relating to that subfield will be answered. To achieve flare, a user must provide evidence of their expertise and their continuing participation in the subreddit by showing us their best answers in their desired flare topic. A user who wishes to obtain flair in, for instance, the Soviet forces in World War II would not have a hard time doing so if they have the expertise because we get questions on this topic very frequently. Building up a slate of good answers for a flair based in the Middle Ages in a particular European country would also not be difficult, as just in the past week we received questions like, who pays for lodging in a medieval royal court? Did it make any difference to medieval commoners who was king? And many more, which allow an answerer to pick a region or country that they know about and write. A user with expertise in ancient Ghana, women's education in Tang Dynasty China, or gay culture in late 19th century France, to pick a few representative subjects, will have a much harder time getting a flair because they will not have the questions to answer. Without the benefit of the flair itself or the support of the community in the private subject that we maintain for our flares, they're likely to drift away. And then when we do eventually get a question that deals with that subject, there's nobody around with the ability to answer it. And then, because the question didn't receive an answer or much attention, the subject dies again. Interest in topics or concepts follows a vicious cycle. If more interest is shown, more people will become curious about it and ask more detailed questions. In April 2017, we got a good look at this effect through a rare Ask Historian specific meme. As a very serious community, the forum as a whole does not have many in-jokes beyond the irritating posting of the word removed that some of our users like to perform on popular questions. But on April 27, 2017, a user named Misio posted a question that seemed to truly capture the interest of everyone on Reddit that day. I'm a hot-blooded young Roman man of the late empire hitting the streets of Rome for a night out with my mates, and I've got Sistercii burning a hole in my purse. What kind of vice and wanton pleasures are available to me, they asked. Based on uh, site data, we estimate that this was seen by about 200,000 people. 
Over the following days, other users copied the basic text, changing up the ethnicity, period, and currency for different settings. This might be the clearest example of interest in a topic, what the historical bad boy could enjoy, perpetuating further interest in that topic. This particular type of mimesis also seemed to push users to step outside of the straight white cis male box. The next day, users posted versions with, I'm a hot-blooded young Arab man of the early Russian Caliphate. I am a hot-blooded young British woman in the Victorian era hitting the streets of Manchester. And I'm a hot-blooded young Nahuatl man of the early Aztec Empire, as well as a handful of others. Remarkably, instead of asking about ancient Greece, medieval England, Viking era Scandinavia, or pre-revolutionary New York, this meme spurred our users to think outside the box and pick protagonists who weren't white men, and in some cases, settings that don't receive much attention on the subreddit. Over the past few years, the mod team has been making a deliberate effort to improve the diversity of the subreddit, both in terms of the demographics of the user base and of the types of expertise found among our flares. The most involved step has been to increase the strictness of our moderation with regard to our interpretation of offensive behavior. Instead of treating the moderation process as a way to find and get rid of bigots, specifically, we are trying to make sure that the subreddit isn't pushing marginalized people away or diminishing their perspectives in general. We encourage both question askers and answers to censor slurs quoted from primary sources so the people those slurs refer to don't have them pushed in their faces when reading about their own history. And we require censoring in subject lines. We do not allow usernames that contain any kind of offensive or demeaning language, even beyond the use of slurs, and often even if it seems to be reclamatory for the same reason. We also no longer allow questions written from the first person perspective of someone committing violence against a marginalized person, such as a slave owner, Nazi, or rapist, typically, and take a harder line on apparently comprehensive responses that don't adequately deal with marginalized perspectives. For instance, an answer on indigenous versus colonizer conflict that inherently treats the colonizers as protagonists and indigenous peoples as antagonists or voiceless others. And it's working. You can see this in the data harvested in our most recent survey. We're attracting more women, those who speak English as a second language, and people with different sexualities. Anecdotally, I've noticed many more questions coming from women, myself. We are also seeing many more questions on varying topics and from varying viewpoints. Questions about working class women, about indigenous communities from their own viewpoints, about India and China and other non-European countries. We've also had an increase in women applying for flair. Of course, these are first steps, and we hope to increase the diversity of our demographics in all areas in the years to come. But it's very encouraging for us, and I think for what it shows could be possible for other communities. Thank you, Cassidy. Our next panelist is William Knight, moderating Ask Historians since 2016 under the username W.A. Ritter. Will is an independent history educator and researcher. He will be speaking about the ideology of the internet, why it is harmful, and how demonstrating historical thinking can deconstruct and diffuse these ideas. Good afternoon, historians, students of history, and those of you listening to this on podcast, whoever you are. My name is Will. I'm from the internet. I remember when that was a really odd thing to say, and now people just kind of nod and say, oh yeah, I come from there myself. What part? Then I tell them Reddit, and they make their apologies and back away quickly. But in seriousness, thank you for having me here in the August calls, halls of the AJ conference. I joke about Reddit's reputation, but the issues with Reddit are no laughing matter. After 2016, this is apparent to even the most casual observer of internet culture. Though they have since been quarantined or dissolved, Hate subs like incels, the Donald, and the Red Pill have done their damage to internet culture and to our society, damage that continues to reverberate. But while the infamy of these subreddits is deserved, the problems on Reddit go deeper. The problems of Reddit go to the heart of the ideology of the website and its users. Moreover, the problems of Reddit and its cause, this unspoken shared ideology, is not Reddit's alone, but it sits at the heart of much of the thinking underlying the internet the thinking of both of its users and of its current overlords. I want to talk to you about this ideology and its flaws, because if we examine this ideology, we will learn a great deal about the state of history and our national consciousness and the damage that the neglect of history has caused. 
And if we look to history and history education, then we may be able to find a solution. To see this ideology, we can look at Reddit, the posts of Redditors and social media users generally. Show me a man's shit posts, and I will show you the man and his ideology. Particularly on Ask Historians, our question and answer format means that the questions people ask tell us a great deal, because no question is without its unspoken premises. Any question about history tells us how people think historical causality works, what changes throughout history and across cultures, and what doesn't, what forces shape the course of history, and what matters in history. Most of all, of course, any question tells us what people are interested in, what they value, as Cassidy told us. And in turn, these assumptions about history show us what they think matters about humanity and what is worth studying about other human beings. Here are some questions for you guys. Did firearms really give conquistadors an advantage over Native Americans? Why was the sling used so extensively and for so long in warfare when the bow was probably more effective? Why were the Chinese advanced in so many technologies but so behind in plumbing? Why did the Western and Northern civilizations become so much more advanced than those of the cradle of civilization? Why weren't the Native Americans more advanced? Islam, Christianity, and Judaism all share substantial theology, despite being traditional enemies. Was pan-Abrahamism pan ever considered or appealed to? Was Caesar's personality the cause of his assassination? Why didn't the West slash Europe really discover and especially try to live in America before Columbus? Now, this isn't a statistically representative sample, but a group selected to illustrate this unspoken ideology. Many questions we get are more innocuous or even perceptive, but the ones I selected do show the kinds of unspoken premises that I'm talking about. When you list them out and then put them together, you can get a picture of the kind of ideological framework many Redditors are working from. Now, of course, most of these elements are an old story for most of us. Great men, the West, the teleology of progress through discrete six stages, the history of ideas and isms. This is, the history, this is history as it was written in the 18th and 19th centuries, much of the 20th, and the history that still dominates YouTube channels, general ed high school textbooks, movies, and Father's Day gift books alike. But if I want to emphasize a few elements that are particularly important, and I think particularly troubling, that are more unique to Reddit than the internet in general. The common thread between these are that they are, these are the more STEM-oriented assumptions, the ones that view history merely as a manifestation of biology or universal anthropology or psychology. When combined with a reflexive, presentist, and unthinkingly culturally chauvinistic viewpoint, the ones that I already cited, the results of this can be dire. The relationship between these assumptions and Reddit's worst impulses is much closer than it initially appears. And of course, this view is not unique to Reddit. I should repeat, though, that this ideology is not universal or even dominant among our users many of whom seek us out specifically because we break the mold of the site. Reddit is full of misfits like this. But nonetheless, this ideology is dominant on much of the site and is in some sense normative for the site as a whole. In pushing back against it, we set ourselves up as countercultural. So what exactly is this ideology? First, let's talk about the idea of ideologies as historical agents. This is harder to see in the questions I listed, but is present nonetheless behind many questions, or in many removed attempts at answers. My friend Kate loves to quote one of her teachers as telling her that Islam is not a historical actor. Only Muslims are. This can be extended to any ideology or religion. It is the people who adhere to a belief who act, not the beliefs themselves. But Reddit disagrees. Figures beloved by Redditors like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris spin a narrative of ideology, especially religion, as an active agent that effectively possesses the adherent, dictating their actions. Religion, Dawkins tells us, is a mind virus 
that through self-reference makes thought outside of its framework impossible. To Harris, different ways of seeing the world are the software that runs on the hardware of our brains. One could reprogram oneself, perhaps, but as long as you're running the mental program, then your actions will be determined by it. Looking at history with this assumption, the people of the past become automatons controlled by their beliefs. Their actions can be explained, or rather explained away, with a simple reference to their creed. The complex motivations of human beings are flattened into the sum of a person's ideological and religious beliefs. The dark side of this argument becomes clear once we see how it is applied to ideologies and religions of the other, particularly Islam. If a religion is a self-referential piece of software running in the computer that is our brain, then we need only know the nature of the religion. Spoiler alert, it's very bad. Before we understand everything we need to know about its adherence, their motivations, and their future actions, very quickly this kind of ideological determinism is used to justify bigotry and even violence against those ideologies that are deemed threats. Once this viewpoint is embraced, a seemingly rational inhabitant of Reddit's skeptical communities becomes a frothing fanatic posting deus vault crusader memes on alt-right message boards. This is a major path to radicalization online. Secondly, let's review the idea that technolog technology is determinative in history. Not just technology, but gadgets, discrete material inventions that transform the world, like removable type or gunpowder. This distinction is important. While properly, technology refers to both the physical artifacts and to how they are used in their social, economic, and political context, gadgets are seen decontextualized. They act on history and social organization, economics, and culture. Rather than these shaping technological developments, they are seen as merely outgrowths of technology or gadgets, the real force behind history. As an illustration of this, the word effective, particularly in a technological context, is one of the words we encounter most frequently in questions. People think of technology in simple terms of better or worse, and do not ask, effective for what? I see this all the time in questions about my own field of study, the weapons and armor of the late Middle Ages and early modern period. Questions often assume that weapons exist outside of their cultural and tactical context, and that they shape tactics in a simple unidirectional way. The introduction of gunpowder is assumed to explain both European dominance over those pe the people they colonized and the decline of the night in Europe itself, rather than both stories being far more complicated. This means that there is no awareness of how technology is the answer to the actual problems that people encounter in their social context, and thus how all technology needs to be seen as a solution to these discrete problems in these contexts not as a matter of objective of superiority or inferiority. This view of technology leads to the final part of Reddit's worldview I wish to highlight, that history is linear and teleological, progressing from primitive simplicity to advanced sophistication. This is not merely a descriptive viewpoint, but a deeply moral one. The march of progress is good. An Australian colonist with an Enfield musket is better than an aboriginal person with a boomerang, according to this worldview. Combine this with Reddit's ideological determinism, which is also laden in unspoken value judgments, and you get a good picture of human history writ large. It is a march out of the primitive into the sophisticated, out of the superstitious into the rational, out of darkness into light. All the cultures of the past existed in order to progress into something greater, which is to say, the society of the present day United States of Europe. This is Whig history, but it is more than that term implies. It privileges white, the white over the non-white, the Western over the Oriental, the rational over the superstitious. It is an ideology of cultural supremacy. Moreover, it is an ideology that blinds it in its adherence to the full humanity of both past peoples and those of other cultures today. By taking technology and belief outside of their context, it outright dehumanizes the subjects of its inquiry and sees them as passive objects of these technological and ideological forces. But since technology and ideology, according to this view, exist on a scale of relative sophistication, this same view renders their, uh, the ideology and technology of other people, and thus the people themselves, objectively inferior 
to modern Westerners. It is a hop, skip, and a jump from this set of widespread assumptions to overt Western supremacy, and from there to Nazism. One, often the most self-consciously rational, and the more self-consciously rational and scientific someone is, the more they are subject to these assumptions, and thus to radicalization. No wonder Reddit and the internet generally has been such a fertile recruiting ground for the alt-right. How did we get here? Put simply, this is the end result of a generation that has been deprived of a historical education and of a humanities education generally. If you are sitting here, you know this. You have, you have heard about history declining as both an undergrad or grad major and as a required part of primary and secondary curricula. You have probably seen this yourself. You may have read The New Yorker's Eric Alterman as he described the decline of historical thinking. He talks about the macro-political effects of this. But at Ask Historians, we see the micro-effects on individual people. Thinking historically is about understanding things in their context and also having the intellectual humility about the limitations of our sources, and thus our knowledge. Without this tool of context, younger white men fall prey to easy answers that ignore all contexts in favor of mechanistic determinism, because they don't even know how to look for context. Conveniently, this determinism happens to justify their own position in society. What is the solution? If the cause is the decline of historical thinking, then reintroducing historical thinking to people has to be the solution. And not to toot our own horn, but that is what we do at Ask Historians, and what we have been doing for the past eight years. Our very question and answer format allows us to take even the most problematically premised question and use it to illustrate the historical method, source criticism, understanding events in their context, and showing the full complexity of causality. The best of our answers, like the best of all public history education, don't just convey facts. They show their work and lay bare the method that lets us learn these things to begin with. By introducing people to this method, we can force them to see things and people and events in their context, breaking down the decontextualization that deprives people who lived in other times and places of the full humanity and deprives the events of their full meaning. Moreover, we can show in our answers that full humanity of those who lived in other times and places, and thus fight against the dehumanization inherent in seeing history as a deterministic march of technological and intellectual progress. We can take a deeply problematic question and use it to illustrate the flaws in its very premises and show just how rich and complex the world really is. As moderators and contributors, we don't just ban Nazis. We hope to show confused young men the beauty and complexity of humanity and our history in all its fullness before the Nazis can get their hands on those young men. Now, this is more than a pitch for you to join us, though if you want to, we have business cards, and we're always happy to host historians as podcast guests and AMA victims, I mean subjects. Now, this is also a call for historians to go where the confused young men of the internet are and to engage them directly before they are lost down the rabbit hole of the internet's most toxic ideology. Also, to reach out to young women and queer people and people of color who long to hear their history and who have never been told by an academic historian just how much of a history they have. Go onto YouTube and show what them what real history looks like. Start a podcast to compete with the Dan Carlins of the world. Go on Tumblr and find young people who are thirsty for queer history and don't know where to find it except from the most simplistic and misleading sources. Seek out history buffs and fans and curious people and show them on Facebook and every other internet cesspit what doing history looks like. Because these may be cesspits, but as we've learned, the internet is no longer just the internet. It is real life. And the stakes couldn't be higher. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Uh, our next speaker is Kyle Pittman. Kyle is a descendant of the Nez Perce and Yakama peoples and grew up on the Pale Indian Reservation in Tacoma, Washington. Kyle is currently a student at George Mason University. In addition to Ask Historians, which he's moderated since 2016 at Snapshot 52, Kyle moderates the largest indigenous forum on Reddit.com, Indian Country. Specializing in Native American and Indigenous Studies, American Indian History, and 
indigenous research methods, Kyle will be talking about the challenges faced on Ask Historians when introducing into the public sphere both indigenous histories and ways of doing history. With a monthly average of nearly two million readers, Ask Historians, indeed social media in general, is a prime location to undermine hegemonic historical narratives at their base in public discourse. But at a time when the humanities often seem to be fighting for their survival, the introduction of subaltern perspectives and historical methodologies poses an extra challenge for indigenous and other scholars. Despite the ongoing decolonization and indigenization of the academy, our panel of nearly 400 subject matter experts and general readership frequently and unintentionally slip into tacit West-centric perspectives when answering and asking questions. The lightning speed of the internet discourse and the perceived need to keep followers comfortable enough to continue reading ends up privileging the dehumanization of people in oppressed groups and the resignation of Native Americans to a bucolic pre-colonization era. The perpetuation of this perspective, despite the best intentions of its unwilling perpetuators, both distorts history and has very real material costs for indigenous peoples today. It is important to understand the value of Ask Historians and why, despite the challenges we will speak about, this platform is necessary for the advocation of indigenous rights, issues, and scholarship. Ask Historians provides a unique and generally inclusive platform to host perspectives of the subaltern that would be hard pressed to find another space with as much reach and structure as provided by Ask Historians. The moderation team of Ask Historians has worked diligently over the years to ensure that indigenous voices presented either through the echoing of allied voices or by indigenous peoples themselves are accounted for to the best of our ability. Yet, as, it, as is common in other spaces, indigenous persons are few and far between, particularly among our flared experts. And similarly to academia, indigenous experts are highly outnumbered by non-native colleagues. There are at least eight flared experts on Ask Historians who specifically identify their studies as being about American Indians or related to studies involving the indigenous peoples of North America, and over 10 other contributors whose studies overlap with areas of American Indian studies. Of these, approximately three identify as indigenous. Therefore, the moderation team has sought different avenues to promote indigenous voices and content within our community. While the number of indigenous flared users is low, there is no shortage of answers to questions regarding indigenous peoples. Through the application and peer review process for flared users, in addition to the standards of the community as enshrined in the rules, Ask Historians has reserved a space that allows for accurate information about indigenous peoples to be provided by qualified community members in a way that is largely absent from the rest of the website and indeed many other spaces of the internet. Answers often contain corrections to erroneous premises and expose underlying ideologies that accompany the framing of inquiries submitted to the subreddit. To highlight these kinds of contributions, many of them have been recorded in the Frequently Asked Questions section of the subreddit wiki. The moderation team of Ask Historians, in attempts to preserve the integrity of history as a discipline being practiced in an online public space and advance the public mission of our community, commits itself to actively promoting indigenous voices and casting light onto colonial shadows ever present among society and with the narratives ever prevalent among the community. We have made a number of efforts to not only defeat colonialist tendencies, but minimize their proliferation. One example of this is our stance toward genocide denialism. While the presence of neo-Nazi elements residing among online spaces might no longer be surprising in the digital age, indigenous peoples continue to resist in a more public fashion the continued beratement and objectification of our cultures, communities, and histories. Genocide denialism, as we at Ask Historians recognize it, is not a tactic reserved in application for the Holocaust. It is utilized by, the dom uh, utilized by political agitators, serious academics, and the lay amateur alike, as it has been normalized by the dominance of colonizing powers. Hence, moderation efforts include executing penalties against malicious users, seeking to further the marginalization of indigenous peoples, and deploying a detailed boilerplate response, known as a macro reply, to problematic inquiries that question the validity of the American Indian genocides, which includes responses to common methods of denialism and credible works to assert this truth. Since February 2017, Ask Historians has published installments of our bi-weekly Monday method series, 
a feature post that explores historical methods, historiography, and theoretical frameworks concerning history that present indigenous perspectives and paradigms. These installments of a featured series present the opportunity for indigenous worldviews to reach a wide audience that is otherwise ignorant of genuine non-Western interpretations of historical events and methods to understand the study of history. These types of posts usually consist of mini essays or brief talking points to encourage discussion in the comments of the post. Once submitted to the subreddit, it is pinned to the top of the front page to promote its visibility. Among the topics covered by the indigenous specific installments are an indigenous approach to understanding history, indi indigenizing a literature review, an indigenous view of technology, science, and history, ethical research engagements with tribes, and how to understand and reconcile contradictions among indigenous sources. As this series has historically been provided as an effort by the moderation team, indigenous specific installments are typically authored by myself as the only identifying indigenous member of the moderators, though there have been several installments provided by non-native flared experts and a number of instances where the topic would naturally allow for indigenous perspectives for discussion. While Ask Historians as a space and platform proves to be supportive of indigenous perspectives in a discipline highly steeped in Western culture, the audience is not always so amicable to perceived incursions of the proverbial other. The curated content of the community has created a regular audience that will generally be welcoming toward different understandings and non-standard narratives in the sense that there is a level of awareness regarding the nature of the form that is Ask Historians, that being a learning environment. However, with a subscriber base of over 1 million users and the potential for popular questions to reach the front page of the entire website, many questions stand poised to attract non-regular users who take up positions as contrarians at best, bigots at worst. As such, it is not uncommon for posts featuring indigenous-related content to be provocatively critiqued, unabashedly questioned, and rigorously worked compared to content more in line with Western standards. In the same vein, it is not uncommon for subaltern content to be bombarded by racist commentary, outright dismissal of indigenous claims, and assertion of Western white dominance. Example one. In a thread for Indigenous Monday Methods post entitled, Is Research Value Neutral? A flared user made a comment taking a Western oppositional approach to the information presented. The post itself questioned the viability of the concept of objectivity in research and how this concept is interpreted by many indigenous peoples. The user in question was moved to interrogate this position by contrasting the indigenous position with the very western position it was seeking to unsettle. Excerpts from their comment included, quote, however I think there are consequences to this that need to be wrestled with. Would you really assert that Native American medicine is as good at describing actual reality as, say, Western medicine? Or to be especially provocative, if you replace Native science with young Earth creationism, does your stance change?" End quote. Though the comment itself was not ill-willed, this line of questioning stood in clear opposition to the viewpoint being presented as it deviated from the normal framework of criticism that objecti objectivity endures under a Western lens. This takes place by the reframing of an indigenous position into a Judeo-Christian reality that is common in Western cultures and is often interpreted as starkly inaccurate to conclusions derived by scientific research. The discussion is no longer about indigenous views on objectivity, but about verifying the validity of indigenous philosophy as a means for meaningful engagement, working to ultimately dismiss the presented indigenous voice by utilizing the dominance of Western thought prevalent on the subreddit. Example two, during a panel Ask Me Anything thread entitled 500 Years Later, Colonization of the Americas, members of the audience directed culturally insensitive remarks toward the subject of the post and members of the panel, including myself. One user asked a question regarding how they should treat land containing a burial mound that is on private property. After several third experts responded to the question about ethical ways to approach their situation, one user questioned why it would matter to disturb graves including that because they died, considering the people they once were is unimportant, and that all that remains is useful historical information we can use to better humanity through knowledge of our shared history. A lengthy discussion then ensued about the supposed necessary passage of time before one could, as I perceived it, begin grave robbing. This example not only demonstrates the conflict that occurs between indigenous and non-indigenous audiences when it comes to cultural customs, 
but also the conflict between the philosophical basis that informs said customs. Whereas indigenous scholars see their work as a service to their people and to indigenous peoples generally, which necessitates commentary on immediate concerns to our communities, many Western scholars, and thus Western audiences, often see their work in individualistic terms, directly relevant, directly relevant to their own status and serving to deny pluralistic context that gives equity to the parties involved. In the example provided here, users prioritize a meaningless rationale of advancing humankind to overstep an oppressed group that has long been subjected to imperialistic research. Example three. In another indigenous installment of Monday Methods entitled American Indian Genocide Denial and How to Combat It, users expressed sharp concern for the classification of imperialistic actions of colonizing powers, including the United States, as constituting genocide. This threat in particular not only encountered dismissal of an American Indian interpretation of historical colonization, but saw the utilization of existing colonial narratives to drown out the critical reproach of said narratives. One user inquired, where do we draw the line between modern genocide and Renaissance brutality? To a layman, I have a hard time taking this at face value because it feels revisionist, which is a position asserting the prevalence of previous violence justifying the perpetuation of more violence. Another user admittedly stated, quote, I'm in denial apparently. My reasonings were not considered in the original post, so I'd like to share. Stated reasons for their apparent denial included justifying colonialist actions because at certain times, various tribes were at war with America. Proffering that because Native Americans did not share the same values as white Americans, the trumped up fear of Natives held by settlers was enough reasoning for colonial governments to act on, quote, the removal slash destruction of Native tribes. And arguing that because certain tribes were universally hated by whites and other Natives, we should question their inclusion among, quote, victims of white oppression. A third user explained, I agree with the notion that there are some people who try to claim that the death count was lower than it really was, but there are also people who try to claim that the death count was higher than it really was. The comparison to Holocaust denial seems inappropriate given that we don't have good numbers on how many Native Americans lived in the Americas prior to colonization. You claim that the actions of settlers made deaths due to disease worse, but how much worse? I'm inclined to think that the vast majority of deaths due to disease were unavoidable. To frame any attempt at moderating more extreme historical claims as denialism seems very biased and concerning to me. This explanation by the user first asserts that a numerical value of deaths is required to classify the atrocities that happened on this soil as genocide. Genocide is a systemic process in which there are typically a series of events contributing to overarching goals that can ultimately result in numerous deaths, but it does not require a quota to be reached before it is actualized. Using a quantification barrier like this is a common tactic of denial, as evident by its continued use of Nazi apologists who work to incrementally decrease the death count of Holocaust victims. Yet, this position is common among Reddit users, for verifiable quantities and measurable outcomes are the norms among a society that prioritizes notions of objectivity to establish ontological and epistemological truths. While the comments made by the general audience of Reddit and those who visit Ask Historians can be troublesome on their own, the other primary component that characterizes the form, the asking of questions, also presents a number of challenges for the inclusion of the subaltern. Because questions are manually approved by the moderators as they are submitted, many are filtered out due to violating our rules and therefore never make it to the front page for the subscriber base to see. However, due to the approach we take with history and our advocacy for involving the public, we do not always remove uh, erroneous or faulty questions. This includes questions with poor premises, misguided conclusions, and inaccurate rationale. It can also include questions that suggest colonialist talking points and presumptions of truth to them. Example one. As a rather more innocuous example, a question was submitted that asked, Native Americans in what is now the USA have often been portrayed as having idyllic lives before Western colonizers arrived. Is there any truth to this? How much easier were their daily lives? Before Western diseases and colonists arrived, was it a life of easy hunting and simple living? The problem here does not necessarily lie within the question itself, but what the question is about. It is centering and questioning the noble savage myth, as identified by myself and other contributors in the thread. While the question provides an opportunity to dispel notions of the noble savage, 
It also incites racist remarks and poor attempts to rectify the myth with further stereotypes and tropes. Removed comments from the thread include, quote, it was never easy. There's, this should be obvious. Have you ever lived in a teepee or a fucking cave? It sucks. Quote, almost always a civilization successfully invading another is possible because the invaders are technologically superior. It definitely does improve the quality of life for the invaded. Quote, well, they're called savages for a reason. Quote, yes, way easier, less diabetes, in all caps. Quote, they didn't have the wheel. Example two. As another example, a user inquired, is it true the natives were oppressing each other before Columbus arrived in the Americas? As it would be later explained in that thread, the premise of this question is both flawed and typical of many questions about Native Americans and indigenous peoples overall that are submitted to ask historians. It is built on a colonialist narrative that seeks to justify oppression and dispossession of indigenous peoples and our lands by citing existing con conflicts among ourselves as reasonable grounds for our removal. The core goals of colonialism are territor territorial expansion, resource extraction, and subjugation of indigenous populations. Thus, it serves the interests of colonial powers to frame indigenous inhabitants as deserving of mistreatment. As is evident, the challenges facing ASK historians as a community and indigenous members of this community are daunting. However, as described at the outset, ASK Historians has committed itself to supporting the subaltern and providing a platform for which we may speak and have our voices heard. As Reddit continues to grow and become more cemented among social media platforms while allowing space for discussion, it will prove to be one of the many battlegrounds where colonialist narratives attempt to proliferate and distort the history we are responsible for safeguarding and retelling. The public mission of Ask Historians ensures that we as the moderators on these front lines are to expose the ideologues and political operatives seeking to co-opt the spaces that attract audiences desiring the content we help to provide. For indigenous peoples, the challenges associated with Ask Historians do not compare to the opportunities afforded to us by having a place among the audience, flared users, and moderation team to write and speak freely about our experiences, our cultures, and our histories. It is my feeling that as long as we keep up the fight to indigenize the academy and indigenize the public, Ask Historians will be ever present as a symbol of these efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Our final panelist is Dr. Kate Stevenson. Kate earned her PhD in medieval history from the University of Notre Dame and joined the mod team in 2016 under the username Sun Against Gold. Her research focuses on religion and lay intellectual culture in Germany before and during the Reformation. Today, she'll be presenting on professional ethics for historical engagement on social media with digital labor, emotional labor, academic labor. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kate. I research the most interesting stuff in the world, and I'm Sun, and I answer the most interesting questions on Ask Historians. Did early modern kids playing with guns say pew pew pew? <laughs> what did drunk people eat before hot wings and takeout pizza? Should I try to ford the river or caulk my wagon and float across? Oh, and does Hildegard of Bingen's visual allegorization of sins in her Liber Vitae Meritorum anticipate the 13th century shift from earlier penitentials to the virtues and vices model more applicable to the rising trend towards pastoral care, or is she developing further the unique moral theology that lies behind her order of retreatum? One of these is not like the other. And right now, only one of these gets you credit on an academic CV. Public outreach is more important than ever, you started saying in academia. Public outreach is necessary. Um, for those of us who are academics, that means one thing above all. It means work. That's right, public outreach is work. It can be fun, and for some of us, it is a vocation in the deepest sense of the word. But it is also work. We need to recognize that, we need to accept it, and we need to deal with it. We need to be Ask Historians at its most fundamental, important, and countercultural. We need rules. We cannot put our heads down, do the work, and just share memes about how miserable we are. Right now, that attitude towards public outreach 
is making this labor an obligatory line on the CV of underpaid and overworked grad students, early career researchers, and adjunct fa faculty. More labor with no extra compensation for it, no way to judge quality, and little comprehension of the time and effort involved on the people looking at job applications. Public outreach will become professional exploitation unless we stop it. Right now, we know we're standing at the beginning of an era, which means that we have the chance to set our own terms if we act. I'm here to talk about how eight years of Ask Historians can help us understand public outreach as work and develop a professional ethics for it, which benefits historians and history. First, public outreach is intellectual labor. It is work in and of itself. It is not merely a repetition or repackaging of our research or rattling off facts from a timeline. No. I wrote about Hildegard and the Liber Vitae Meritor in my second year of grad school, and then my advisor and I decided I should study something else. I wrote about Pew 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 my second year on Ask Historians, and 193,000 people clicked on the thread. What we do as academics is overwhelmingly not what the public is interested in, interested in what non-academic readers are going to actually click. I ask historians, most of our popular questions do fall into those categories. What was it like to live in the past? Where did this modern thing come from? Is this movie accurate? What did Hitler think about this? How did Hitler react to that? Now these are questions whose answers are grounded in historical scholarship but they also require original research and analysis, not just repetition and synthesis. Most of the time, we put together answers drawing from multiple secondary sources, building on earlier scholarship. But sometimes, it means we have to do flash fly primary source research because the topic is new or the topic is simply that far removed from anything an academic journal considers acceptable. These questions represent genuine public interest. The questions are where we start, but as historians, as historians, not just people writing about the past, we don't end there. I suggest a personal metric that we all know and love, colon cancer. If your topic is genuinely the first snappy part of your book title, probability leans towards it's probably a public outreach. If your topic is the actual description of your book title that follows the colon, it's probably aimed at academics. Let's make a saint, colon, writing the contested sanctity of Magdalena Bettler. There you go. We have to think about what people outside academia want to hear about. Then we have to figure out how to use, why did some people become saints if everyone in the Middle Ages was so religious, to talk about sexism in medieval sources and in modern interpretation of them, and how to judge between competing narratives of the past. Public outreach must be publicly accessible, publicly interesting, and it must be public history. Second, public outreach is emotional labor. All right, reviewer number two. Even if you've never submitted a journal article, you know reviewer number two. And you know that opening the feedback email or page to see the constructive comments from reviewer number one followed by the utter, utter bullshit from reviewer number two who clearly did not read your article and just as clearly read your article but is, but is jealous that you have the topic correct? Well, this is Arlie Hochschild's foundational definition of emotional labor, when an employee must manage their emotions and present a facade in trying circumstances in order to protect the feelings of customers. As scholars, of course, we're not immune from, hurt, from the hurtful feedback from people we can't offend. In the moment, or years down the road, when we still remember that our writing is more appropriate for a TV miniseries than a formal 10th grade term paper. This emotional labor is already part of our paid or unpaid jobs. Public outreach on the internet adds an entire extra dimension of emotional labor that is also part of our work. On Ask Historians, we do our, as moderators, we do our best to shield users. Civility is our number one rule, and prohibition of any form of bigotry is number two. But the moderators still see what the community doesn't. So you'll see it on your blog, you'll see it in your tweets, you'll go back to the Wikipedia page, 
a week later to find someone reverted all your edits back to what is factually demonstrably wrong. With reviewer number two, you get the email and you're alone. Online, it keeps coming and coming and other people see it and it hurts. With Ask Historians, the primary way we deal with this is social support. We have a forum for flares and then the chat app that we use as moderators to coordinate Ask Historians and to discuss the accuracy or sufficiency of borderline ancestors. Uh, did it again, you guys. <laughs> borderline answer, answers is equally or more important to help us deal with those deleted comments and bigoted questions that are anything but deleted for us. One of the most important things about this is that we are comfortable emphasizing this frustration and resignation and anger to others. But you know what? I was not comfortable expressing it with my grad cohort. I am not comfortable expressing it with my professional colleagues who are in academia. I had and have the strong impression when I've tried to mention Ask Historians that this work is seen as less than. That Ask Historians, uh, but Ask Historians shows that support is necessary. So as professional historians, we need to own our public outreach, not just the Twitter accounts where we talk to other academics. We need to own our public outreach, not just do it. Third, public outreach is gendered labor. A professional ethics for public outreach must account for structural discrimination as well as individual acts of bigotry. To be clear, I'm not making light of sexism within academia or of other types of discrimination in public outreach. Um, however, the heavily textual nature of the internet combined with English's ongoing insistence on gendered pronouns means that issues of female, male, and non-binary gender can never hide. The environment for public outreach online is actively hostile to women. Ask Historians is a perfect and shameful crystallization of this. Being hosted on Reddit gives us an enormous boost in audience. It's a choice that we make in order to reach the large audience that we do. But as a massive forum that serves as a microcosm of the internet online, Reddit is the online homestead of incels, or involuntary celibates, and then brain cells, the intellectual side of the involuntarily celibate community who still hasn't figured out that their name actually reads as bra incels. This means that we get questions, wrong answers, wrong answers, I said ans I say ancestors every time, okay. Wrong answers and comment replies from people who consider themselves incels. These comments might be sexist, they might not be, but we know with every answer we write, the potential to hear slurs, insults, catcalls, and yes, rape threats is always a possibility. But the environment for public outreach online is also passively hostile to women. One of my favorite Reddit stories. I wrote a fun answer that got some attention from a different, much larger, best of subreddit, right? One of the first commenters there was an Ask Historians reader who referred to me as she. This is correct, this is the pronoun I use, and this is the pronoun I try to use actively on Ask Historians so people can be like, oh my gosh, there's actually a woman here. Um, on this sub, a reply challenged the assertion of she. At which point, multiple strangers on the internet proceeded to debate whether I'm male or female. I thought this was hilarious. But for some historians, reading that thread could have required enormous amounts of emotional labor. What if I were a trans woman, and every time I saw he, it gave me waves of nausea and fear and bad memories? What if I were battling PTSD from being raped, and suddenly the type of people that ask historians bans are explicitly thinking of me as a woman? But even my laughter has a darker side. The story is also a, rem a reminder that the internet's default assumption are that the internet's default assumption that people are male harms the ability of women scholars, when recognized as women, to be taken seriously. A woman didn't write that, so I didn't write that. Internet audiences accept the authority of men with less basis than they require of women. Women must do more intellectual labor in order to have the same degree of successful public outreach. 
In addition to women scholars and non-binary people dealing with passive and active sexism, uh, many women are trapped in a catch-22 that, like, it just really sucks. The content of historical information online is vastly imbalanced towards male historical figures and stereotypically male historical interests. We absolutely, 100%, necessarily must work to correct this. Um, and in fact, if the academic organizations working to um, reform Wikipedia are led by, um, if I can brag for a moment, the Society for Medieval Feminist Scholarship, um, we must recognize that the tasks that most need doing concern women in the ancient world, people of color in the Middle Ages, people with disabilities in colonial Africa. The problem is, it also remains the case that it's mainly women who are interested in women historical figures. It's mainly women who use women historical figures in their own work. So when we stress the need to get information about women online, like it or not, purposefully or not, we're placing an extra burden on women. Extra time, extra work, extra intellectual and emotional labor. A professional ethics of public outreach must account for these extra difficulties faced by women and the extra need for writing about women's history in a public environment. Women focusing on all topics and women's history scholars of all genders must receive more credit. And the additional work done by women scholars and the need for additional credit brings me to my final point. For people in academia, public outreach is not digital labor. Uh, Maria Mies defines digital labor as the creation of original content and information for a mass audience, usually but not always online, that is done because the creator wants to and serves as its own reward. But for every organization like the medieval, for every academic organization like the Medieval Academy that awesomely establishes a committee to deal with Wikipedia, for every school like the University of Reading that awesomely hires a professor's social media outreach coordinator, it becomes more and more explicit that public outreach is necessary has become part of the job. So here's the heart of this all. You want a professional ethics for public outreach? Value it according to the only metric that matters. Will it get you a job? We say public outreach is necessary. That's why I'm on this panel. That's why you're in this room. The roles of a historian in academia, thus research, teaching, service, and now public outreach. It's not the equivalent of a line on your CV. It's the equivalent of an entire section. Job, job applicants should be required to demonstrate any public outreach involvement. Hiring committees should be required to recognize the significance of these projects. Like sections on research and teaching, the public outreach section should include a list of projects, sample writing like blog posts or Twitter threads, and a personal ph philosophy statement outlining your strategies for making public outreach successful. If public outreach is a value, we need to make it have value. In the context of 21st century academia, that means public outreach labor must help people get into PhD programs, win fellowships, get full-time jobs, and earn promotions. Now, this really shouldn't sound revolutionary or utopian. Public historical outreach is intellectual labor, it is emotional labor, it's original labor, it's academic labor. Why shouldn't we get credit for the work that we do? As academics, we are conscious that right now is the start of an era. The maturation of social media meets the fresh weaponization of inaccurate history for malignant ends. We are conscious of the need to fight this through historical public outreach. We are conscious of the need to fight this now. Our awareness of this gives us the chance to develop guidelines that can limit the exploitation of scholars today and tomorrow. So I do propose a professional ethics for public outreach. It emphasizes reaching a non-academic audience, not pretending we are. Our efforts meet people in the way that they think and wonder about the past, not through the questions that we are trained to ask. If we see a need to push a particular subject, we offer incentives for providing content in that subject. 
and we recognize public outreach as academic labor that counts towards getting a job, not as a check mark on the CV, but in accounting for its amount, quality, and success. We have the chance to get this right, but we have to act together and we have to act now. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. We will now be taking questions from the audience. Um, please be aware that we are recording this for our podcast. If you don't want to be on that, um, just let us know afterwards and we can take you off of the section. And also, if you are asking a question and want to be on it, please try and speak up so the microphone in the back can hear you. Um, so, any questions? Yes. Uh, I want to thank you all for uh, such thoughtful and enlightening presentations. Uh, as an aside, I want to thank you for giving me the language to finally describe your doctor's renegade uncle as a borderline ancestor. Um, the, the thing I was thinking about most was how all of you as scholars and intellectuals are trafficking in complexity, uh, nuance, uh, context, and critical thinking. And many of your adversaries are operating in a world of clarity, black and white thinking, and neat and clean sound bites. And I'm wondering if there is something about the platform of the internet that privileges the latter over the former. And um, I was also thinking a little bit about um, a program some of you might be familiar with called Air America which came on the radio waves maybe 10 or 15 years ago to be a kind of counterweight to the Rush Limbaugh's and the Fox News's of the world. And it really never worked. And it seems like there's something uh, about scholars or intellectuals or maybe people on the left in general that they have difficulty finding the kind of voice to soon battle with their adversaries in these kinds of environments. Yeah, I think there's definitely a lot to that. Um, I think that part of it is that people want quick answers and people know that they can find them on the internet. And I think that does tend to create a kind of vicious cycle. Uh, when you are going up against someone like Dan Carlin, who offers extremely kind of bite-sized, extremely entertaining takes on the sorts of history that young men are interested in, mostly war, um, then you are already, in a sense, you know, you're fighting at, at a disadvantage because people go to him because he's so digestible and because he's so simple. Um, and absolutely, that's an issue. And I think it's one reason, and it's an issue that's better and worse on different platforms. Uh, I'm not as much of a Twitter user as a lot of other folks are. I'm not on Tumblr as much as uh, some of our other contributors. But I think some of these platforms because they emphasize brevity, or they're more self, um, self-curated, make it harder to reach people. Because people on some platforms like Twitter and Tumblr, because of the way you create your feed, um, they become, it becomes a lot harder to reach people because they essentially only see what they want to see. Uh, and the same is true on Facebook. Um, I will say that one way that we can encourage complexity is through the creation of community. Uh, and I think that's what, um, Again, not to do our own horn, but what we've been able to do, because if you invite people to join a community, you don't just invite them to look at one post about um, you know, the indigenous understanding of history and time, or you know, uh, women's fashion in the early republic in America, or you know, uh, how a medieval army was equipped. You're inviting them to participate in a larger scholarly conversation. And I think it's through that repeated participation that you really get a sense of complexity. And it's by continuous engagement that people lose that desire for simplicity. Because if you're getting complexity again and again and again, that's what really wears you down because you just see how much richer things really are. Um, and that's tricky. Uh, I think that there's different ways on different platforms to achieve this. Uh, YouTube channels, oddly enough, can do this because you have subscribers that continuously 
uh, are broadcasted to. Um, you can definitely do this through a podcast, which is why there's so many successful and often excellent history podcasts, as well as some terrible ones. Um, so I think that's something to keep in mind, is just, you know, it isn't about this is, you know, a thread on Twitter that will educate people and will be a counter to, you know, some terrible thread about Bo Brummel. Um, that was for you, Cassidy. Um, but it's about, you know, engaging with people over the long term, because that's how, you know, complexity is oddly addictive. And I think, you know, once you get a, a, a taste of it, then you lose your taste for simple, easy answers. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so definitely in line with what Will was saying, um, on Reddit it's pretty popular, right? The, the acronym TLDR, too long, didn't read. And that's because people are really accustomed to getting a short, quick, just the facts, heavy, heavy scare quotes on that, about history or any kind of topic that's presented. Um, speaking of, in my case in particular, that's really not possible to do because when I have to answer a question that's presented on the subreddit, it could be a very simple question. Like one time someone asked about the, essentially they were asking about the origins of fry bread, um, which is common today among many um, Native American communities. Um, and they had asked, what did we put on our fry bread before white people came to the Americas? Well, fry bread didn't exist before then. So you have to explain the history of fry bread rather than just saying, well, it didn't exist before then, moving on, right? It, to answer that question to our standards, but also in a way that's engaging to actually educate the person and the people who read that comment, you need to take the time to unpack, well, this is what happened with colonialism. This is the creation of reservations. These are the rations that were given and how fry bread came about as a result of that. Then here's a more contemporary sense of why fry bread has been cemented as a staple food in a lot of Native American communities. And that can easily come out to you know at least 1500 words around then of just describing this whole thing but people aren't necessarily interested in taking that time so it goes back to also um, what was talked about during um, during our papers is cultivating that historical thinking um, cultivating that desire um, in a space where people are not going to expect uh, just the facts or just a brief statement and that's really where the curation of the moderation team comes in where we don't allow just the facts kind of posts that are only like two sentences right um, that we want you to be able to go in depth provide a comprehensive answer to describe and provide contextualization um, that's where that comes in and it's unfortunate because uh, as Will just said you don't get that on many other places um, on the internet a lot of it's based on that self curation um, and how much time the people want to put into doing that and then it's it's just left out there in the void for people to read and possibly glean something inaccurate from it um, so in our case a lot of that really that, that cultivating of that ability to be and to digest more complex things is directly dependent on our ability to effectively curate the subreddit Yes. that I personally deal with the questions we get is um, you're just gonna hear about women when I write the answer even if you didn't ask about it um, somebody something you know people often ask like did medieval people work out and what they want to know is did medieval knights even lift and I'm sorry you're gonna hear what Christine de Pizan wrote about noble women going for walks that's what you're gonna hear from me um, so one way is um, as I talked about we complain with each other we complain to each other about the questions we get um, but then, and then some we also have 
options to, um, we run uh, floating, floating features we call, where we invite people to just submit what they want to talk about. Um, we do, we have a great questions um, a poll and a contest every month to determine like what, what's the good question. But honestly, the most important way is to take questions and then to talk about what they're really asking. And I think one other piece of it, of course, is you know the optional nature of answering. I mean, if we get something that completely blows up, we'll reach out to people, we'll try to get them to answer. And we also know people want to answer, especially people in some fields that don't get a lot of questions. Um, you know, not World War II, not Hitler-related, um, slight exaggeration. But, um, you know, and I think then the volunteer nature becomes really important. Uh, the other piece there, though, is, yeah, sometimes it is exhausting. I mean, when you get a sense that you're being pumped for information by people, that sucks. Uh, and oddly enough, it actually hits some of the more popular or like coded mail flare areas fairly heavy, because I don't know how many fantasy novelists <laughs> I've somewhat unknowingly coached on their world building. Um, because that's why people want to know this. Or, you know, GMs for running a D&D campaign. Um, don't call it plate mail and I'm happy, whatever. Um, but the, uh, at the same time, I think, you know, that's where the volunteer nature comes in. You know, we even tell people sometimes that say they're novelists or whatever, hey, you know, this is something that people sometimes don't answer because they don't feel like feeling like they're essentially being someone's own being research assistant. Um, so uh, yeah, something that we definitely do struggle with. Yes? Um, hi, I, I'm sorry I missed the first two presentations in a fantastic panel. Um, that was so exciting. I'm, um, I, I, so probably I want to say I'm really excited, but also that beyond that, it's important to really echo. I, I want to contextualize this whole panel historically a little bit. Uh, meta contextualization, <laughs> something like that. Um, by saying this, that um, one of the interesting things about the audience as well as the panelists to me is that people my age and older, um, I'm a full professor, I'm in my late 50s now, uh, people my age and older here are rare. And that this particular age, because they shut down the job market after COVID, has been skewing much older. And so I've been feeling like sort of at the center of the age range uh, in the other rooms I've been in so far uh, yesterday and today. Here I feel like an old person. <laughs> this is great. Um, so that's really good. The other thing is that because I therefore have a slightly longer perspective, um, I, I just want to say that we've already ad addressing that uh, question of the ethics of doing this kind of work. Um, and benefiting from other people doing this kind of work. I just want to say that I've, I've been involved in various ways with various kinds of internet communities, uh, starting with live journal, I think. Um, so I'm really old. Uh, so um, <laughs> some of you, though, you were like babies when you did. I was, I was already tenured when I found live journal. So, um, uh, so starting with that and moving on from there, um, and consequently, one of the things I've seen is shifts in the way that the public addresses uh, people who identify themselves online as historians, the kinds of questions they ask, and the kinds of labor we're asked to do. And you might call it a shift from narrative history to vaguely social history. It is true that people really want to know a lot about daily life in other times. But that's because they've been educated partly by film, partly in all kinds of ways, that daily life in other places and times is not what it was now. This is actually a great improvement because in the beginning it was all like, you know, well, was Thomas Jefferson a nice guy or not a nice guy? You know. Um, so the fact that we moved away from biographical history being the only history to asking questions about daily life and ordinary experiences, that's a huge improvement. And I think the people who 
were doing the work of, of teaching history to a, or presenting history to a broad public were really responsible for that, and that's fantastic. And um, so I'm just gonna throw that out there. Also, oh wait, last thing is that in my career, I've also seen um, some improvement in um, how our engagement with internet communities is valued by not just hiring committees, search committees, but also tenure committees and promotion committees. So um, I never mentioned that anybody, anybody, anybody as my job, my involvement was life journal. But uh, when I came up, when I came up for promotion from associate to full professor, I had a whole page on my CV about the time I did an AMA for uh, an Ask Me Anything for Ask Historians uh, about you know my participation in a feminist historian Facebook group, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, and that was part of how I got uh, promoted, was that I have done that, that is my public service. Uh, so that is possible to do at major research universities now, it was not possible 10 years ago. Um, progress, that, you know, you're exactly right, it's just felt like that is a thing that needs to happen. I'm just here to say encouragingly that some of that is actually happening, yeah. which is great. It's, it, as I said, I, I, you know, I didn't feel comfortable discussing this with my grad cohort. I wouldn't feel comfortable saying this on this panel. If, 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 if I, I mean, yes, I get really, really frosty receptions, but I do have a section of my stuff from Medievalist.net and Medieval Studies Research Blog and all that stuff on my CV too. But, um, but it's happening, and we, and my, my point today is that we need to make it explicit that it's happening and acknowledge this. For sure, not just have it something be that kind of goes along with whatever, as I said, put our heads down and exchange memes. Like we need to actually be consciously aware of this to stop, to prevent what has happened from just adding more exploitation in other areas. That actually get credit for it that is additional instead of just being like a thing that now everybody else has to have. We're getting a couple flares I know who started to put it on their CV and promoting it as like part of who they are, but it's an uphill battle still. I don't know, I see. <laughs> Any other questions? I mean, I live on, I live on the internet, don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> the, the problem that you, you're asking of, of us is that we spend most of our, most of our, probably most of our free time on asking stories because it's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what this? It's a rewarding hobby. Don't get don't get us wrong. <laughs> yeah. it's, so I, I mean, not not necessarily to answer your question, but just kind of expand. You know, in addition to Reddit, like we have a presence too on Facebook, on Twitter, um, more of those big general mainstream platforms as well. Really, that helps to um, advocate the work that we're just doing um, on the subreddit itself. Um, so usually, those consists of, of promoting them. Um, there's. In terms of like other other platforms, other um, projects, you know, a lot of that's really just built through relationships. People who connect with us, people who we um, meet through doing this kind of outreach. Um, we're trying to have a bigger presence at these kinds of conferences so we can make those kinds of connections. So for the most part, they exist at that kind of stage with relationship building. And actually, um, I do want to comment on one area that I think is actually. Um, having some trouble, uh, po popular history books. When you go into the bookstore, I've often gone in there and it's almost entirely still books about politicians, about leaders, and about the military. And occasionally you'll see the list of books that is always inevitably about badass women. Just a list of badass women. So this is one area in which I think that we have completely failed, that so far we have mostly failed to have any kind of like genuine public outreach, you can buy some really great popular history books on Amazon, but you can't buy those at Barnes and Noble. And um, that's one area where we, that I think historians, you know, when I'm thinking about um, academic historians doing public outreach, that that's the kind of thing that we really need to do. And some, a platform like Ask Historians or Public Medievalist or um, some, some people's Twitter accounts really does show that we can get the public to listen to, to a discursive instead of a narrative view of history. Um, we just have to do it with catchy titles. Um, so, I mean, obviously, 
as historians, like we don't, we're, like you said, we're, our content isn't really suited for that, but we definitely get a lot of it in terms of fact checking, because those will end, like those end up being memified, and they'll go around on a Twitter thread and get 10,000 retweets, they'll end up on Facebook, get a million likes or whatever. And I mean, that really gets to, I would say, the heart of what Will's talking about in his paper and how there's a ideology of the internet and people will take whatever conforms to what they already believe and perpetuate that around. And it's hard to fight back against. Um, I can't remember what the name of it is, but it's one of those laws of the internet about how it takes 10 times as much effort to refute bullshit as it does to say it. So if 10 people see it and then you push back against it, only one person's ever gonna see your, your refutation. And I mean, we, we try to be a platform for that and we try to make sure that we are a place where that content isn't going to start and where we're going to end it. And like uh, Kyle just said, outreach coming to a place like this, trying to increase our visibility is how we can fight back against it, but you can't force people to read it. So I'm not sure how many, how much weapons we have to go out there and actively, we can't shut it down. We can only shut down what's in our space, but um, we can try to be a platform where people can come, where people can, if they have an inkling that something is weird about it, they can come and they can figure out the truth behind it. Yeah, and, and so really, when it comes to, to people who want to um, proliferate um, that kind of th those kinds of uh, items, you know, misrepresentation of what might be out there, just taking snippets, decontextualizing them, really, we we have to be responsive to that. We can't necessarily be in a proactive position, aside from efforts like doing this, where we can then increase readership, and hopefully that brings more people to a place where those kinds of items are then put into context. Um, I would say, though, you know, we talked. Uh, all of us virtually talked about the amount of readership that does come to these kinds of posts, right? You know, a comment, um, an answer that's given to any given question could yield up to 200,000 people who read that response. Um, so, gen so through the increasing of our popularity, through doing this outreach, right, we reach a lot more people than we're than, than we can be even be aware of at times. Um, so ultimately, as Hunter said, a lot of the stuff that does get posted, the problematic things, find its way back to us because we now have garnered and created a reputation as being a fact-checking place, as being the place where you can put things into context. Um, so I would say probably one of the best proactive things we can do is coming to these conferences, is utilizing other platforms, is developing our name, so that and increasing the participation of other people who want to join and become a flair contributor, because then ultimately that's going to seep into these other areas uh, to help, if not prevent these kinds of things, at least have a surefire way to respond to them immediately. Um, I think. Sorry, one more. And the other, the other point I just want to make is. By being, uh, by you know, refusing to accept TLDR too long didn't read, and by um, coming to what we write from an actual perspective of history instead of just things that happened in the past, as historians, it actually works to kind of foster a mindset where people don't go for the TLDR. Like you know, I talk about us getting linked on other on other subreddits, and you know, you know, they'll they'll say something like, um, you know. You Sun Against Gold talks about the different things that drunk people ate throughout history. You know, it's not going to say You Sun Against Gold explains how drunk people during history ate a lot. You know, so that they, we actually kind of can encourage people to think in a more complex way. Hopefully, it seems like. Ask the rest of your questions about history on Ask Historians, please. Well, it's three o'clock exactly, so we are wrapping things up. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, panelists.